Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Prince George's County uh, 2021 Historic Preservation Month celebration. My name is Howard Berger, and I'm the supervisor of the Prince George's County Planning Department's Historic Preservation section, and I am your uh, default MC for this evening. Um, anyway, uh, having said that, uh, tonight, uh, for the second time, this annual event is again a virtual one. And we hope that next year we'll all be able to gather in person as we have in the past. And that looks more likely with every passing day. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Tonight's program is an opportunity for local heritage organizations and interested parties to gather and to review the past year's activities. We will do so through a series of brief presentations. And at the conclusion of these presentations, there'll be ample time for questions. So please hold them until the end. And in the interim, if you prefer, please feel free to use the chat function so that you don't forget your question and that we can have something of a record of it. Um, before we get started, I, I wanna acknowledge and thank in advance the people who are making presentations this evening, as well as those people who facilitated this event. In particular, Megan Bacco, the new executive, executive director of ATHA Maryland Milestones for her technical support, which we all just witnessed, which was excellent. Um, and also a, a shout out to the social media staff of the Prince George's County Planning Department's um, Publications Division for helping us to publicize this event in various formats. Uh, so having said all that, uh, without further ado, I think we'll uh, go to the next slide so you get a sense of who will be uh, speaking this evening. And we will start, I hope, with some brief welcoming remarks or whatever uh, from Megan Bacco in her new capacity as the Executive Director of Maryland Milestones Anacostia Trails Heritage Area Incorporated. I don't know if this is your first formal event, but certainly welcome. Is that my cue? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, uh, I, I do uh, want to echo uh, Howard's um, words and feelings that soon we will all get back to um, meeting with each other and our stakeholders and clients and all those people we serve, past, present, uh, and uh, do the thing that preservationists love most, which is site visits, sometimes followed by you know, a lunch at a local spot. So I do, um, I do recognize that uh, it's been uh, quite a challenge uh, through the last um, 14, 15 months. And within that time, um, I have become the new executive director at Merrill Milestone. So uh, definitely a, a time of change, uh, but also a time of um, amazing um, opportunity to reflect on uh, what we're capable of and certainly how people uh, value Place. I think that uh, there's a great opportunity here between all of the great data we had about open spaces, about people uh, waiting to get back onto the lawns and uh, grounds of their favorite historic sites, and, and certainly all of the trails, uh, bikes, strollers, walking, kayaking, um, certainly that, it, that are plentiful in Anacostia Trails heritage area. Uh, so it's been... Um, a challenging but uh, wonderful time to be able to meet so many uh, folks, um, uh, meet so many folks uh, virtually, and um, certainly understand the challenges. Now, um, as a new executive director, um, uh, anything you don't like, call Aaron. Anything you do like, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm kidding. Aaron Markovich, uh, who is not on the call today, but I just do want to give him a quick shout out. Uh, he uh, served the heritage area for 10 years as executive director. So um, if, if folks remember the uh, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Plainsburg and uh, much of the work that he did to uh, make that a county and in some ways statewide celebration, truly uh, remarkable work. And so I just want to, uh, he's fine. He's fine. He's got a new job, um, but do want to make sure um, that we recognize his service. And uh, certainly um, I've inherited a 
an organization with um, fantastic legacy of uh, support and service and success and uh, something I hope to continue. Um, a couple of the projects that I inherited, which I definitely want to just give a quick update about, is of course during um, COVID, we were as supportive uh, as we could be uh, to our towns and our trails and trying to um, support the businesses that were able to stay open and um, make those connections to all the folks that were maybe using the trails for the first time. I know that I explored my neighborhood uh, up here in Baltimore uh, to extents that I had not in the past. Uh, and along those lines, we're hoping to improve um, some of that network of um, tourism resources uh, in support of our small businesses and restaurants, uh, be they in a main street or in a plaza. Uh, I think Prince George's County, you're well aware, have different perceptions of what a main street might look like, but certainly all small businesses um, need and uh, kind of deserve our, our help now for um, uh, keeping us fed through the pandemic. So that's one thing that I have uh, my eye on there, are supporting our main streets and small businesses. We also started a project um, in partnership with um, MNC PBC's Black History Program. And so we are working on a series of civil rights signs uh, that will be accompanied by a website and um, uh, signs in the ground, but also um, a website that uh, we're really hoping to get those in the ground. Uh, in fact, we have to just, to, there's only so many extent, COVID extensions you can uh, get, but we're really excited to um, be nearing the conclusion of that, which hopefully there'll be signs in the ground uh, this fall. Um, we also finished a, um, a report on new and continued uh, interpretation of the Battle of Bladensburg. So I mentioned the 200th anniversary, um, but what do we do now? And what has changed and what do we wanna do um, related to continuing to tell that story? So that's something um, that has always been at the forefront of Anacostia Trails, um, uh, uh, their role in the community. So um, that's just a brief overview. I've got, uh, um, you know, those are the projects we're working on, but of course we also support um, projects throughout the region. So we have a mini grant called a rocket grant, which is up to $5,000. And then we also um, are the gateway and support provider for uh, nonprofits and municipalities to to um, apply for Maryland historic Maryland uh, historic. You guys, I really should know that. I really do know this. MHAA Maryland Heritage Area Authority grants, and those are up to a hundred thousand dollars. So um, besides the fact I just um, flubbed the acronym, please count on me to help you either access those grants or other grants that might be related to public history, um, heritage tourism. Um, and and I would be your uh, your person on the forefront for that. So um, with that, I just am happy to be able to introduce myself and for some of you reintroduce myself um, and certainly kind of give you a, a preview of what I'm, I'm hoping to do. Uh, and I'm, I feel very lucky and fortunate to have gotten a new job during COVID and I feel like I'm in the right place. So I really uh, thank you everybody for such a warm welcome so far and um, please do reach out to me um, I will put my uh, contact information in the chat, but thank you. Thank you, Megan, that was great. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dennis Pogue, who is the Interim Director of the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And uh, Dennis is gonna brief us on the activities of the program this past year and um, anything else he uh, wants to impart. And before I forget, it is my understanding that Dr. Pogue uh, is going to be retiring soon, and I want to thank him for his uh, service at the University of Maryland um, in advance of that, and uh, tell him how grateful we were for his participation uh, in various and sundry projects that involved the planning department and internships and and other things that that brought students and professionals together. So, Dennis, thank you for all of that, and we look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Thank you, Howard. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. And so, I see my role as essentially updating you on and um, you all on what the University of Maryland Historic Preservation Program has been up to for the last year, uh, with a special focus, of course, on you know projects in Prince George's County. So um, just to, to start off with a little bit of, a, uh, of, a, of an intro, 
So um, for those of you who are not familiar with our program or have not been familiar with it for a while, um, it's a growing program and we have lots of, of dual degrees, which is a, a, major, uh, a major effort for us. And so we have seven uh, graduates uh, this year and they reflect those dual degrees. We have two masters of historic preservation, two dual degrees with architecture, one with anthropology, one with planning, and one with real estate development. And the dual degrees uh, really reflect the diversity you know, of the program. Our students uh, come into the program from a variety of backgrounds uh, and leave it uh, you know, with, with going in, in many, different, many different directions. So um, that's just a reminder of that. We have a lot of cooperative relationships uh, with the city of, uh, with Bostwick, the city of Bladensburg, um, and uh, MNCPPC with, with PALS, and I'll explain what PALS is in a minute, Prince George's County Parks and Recreation. We're very, um, you know, very eager and very interested in supporting preservation, you know, in our backyard. So even though our students, you know, do projects that are pretty wide ranging, we like to be involved in that. And so we have had long-standing relationships with different organizations and historic properties uh, in Prince George's County. And uh, tonight I'm gonna give you a, a, just a bit of a, a review of some of those and those recent activities. I also wanna call out that over the last few years, we've really moved into the area of digital documentation. It's a major force in the field of historic preservation. Um, you know, it allows historic structures to be documented in ways that we never imagined 20 years ago, uh, and that that documentation then can be turned around and used in a variety of purposes uh, for uh, drawings and, and very exciting interpretive aspects as well, which I think is the most, uh, the most important part of it going forward. It will uh, serve as a way that we can get you know, historic preservation uh, results out you know, to the public, I think, in, in interesting and exciting ways. Uh, and as I said, local engagement has always been a major focus of the program uh, ever since it's, it's been here, and that's what I want to focus on today. So some of the topics, some of the projects. Um, so Bostwick um, is a historic house in Bladensburg, a very interesting mid-18th century house that the city of Bladensburg has owned uh, for a number of years, for about 20 years now. The university has had a long-term relationship uh, with them, cooperating with them on the preservation of the building. The picture on the left shows the structure about, about 100 years ago. Um, and it shows very prominently the buttress on the left-hand side that's helping to hold up uh, the, the wall of the house. Um, this, unfortunately, was a poorly designed house from the very beginning. And so structurally, it has had major problems um, you know, ever since it was, it was built. The buttress was put there, we think, as early as just a few decades after the house was built. You see the buttress on the right. Uh, it has gone through, it has deteriorated considerably over the last, the last few years. Um, and that's because of storm damage, the earthquake, uh, lack of attention, a whole variety of things. And so we've been working with the city for several years now on addressing, addressing this problem. The plan is to replace the buttress in kind. So essentially uh, go back with uh, you know, a, a version of the buttress, but better, uh, one that'll be uh, better equipped to actually do what it was intended to do, which is to support the structure. Uh, support, to support the structure. So uh, our students have been working there. You can see the uh, temporary iron steel reinforcements that have been put up to support the building. That picture shows students in the process of dis uh, dismantling the buttress. It was determined by structural engineers to be inadequate. And so it had to come down and be, and be rebuilt. So the image on the left is a digital scan of the buttress uh, that showed it at that stage uh, in the demolition. So we've been documenting it all the while, all, the, all, all, all during the project so that we make sure that we don't lose uh, any information. And then the, the, the uh, drawing on the right is just give you an indication uh, of what's gonna go back. So it's gonna look as much like the buttress as possible, but it's gonna have some structural components to it that as I said, hopefully will make it, allow it to do its job you know, even better. Um, our Historic Preservation 611 course on research methods is a course that is uh, required uh, for all of our students. And it focuses on developing 
you know, skills, research skills that we feel it's important for our students to have. And so it's this course uh, focuses each year on a community uh, in our area. And we uh, work with local community members to research their houses and then uh, develop essentially uh, house histories. And then we present those back to the community uh, we make those available to them. So it's an opportunity not only for students to do research, but also to get used to uh, you know, working with folks, uh, working with people in the community to help tell their story. So last fall, it was North, Brent, North Brentwood, which of course is uh, a very important, it's one of the earliest incorporated African-American communities uh, in the area. And so uh, it has been neglected by many folks for a long period of time. And so it's the kind of, of community kind of project that we're especially interested in doing and having our students uh, become involved with that. So this is just one of the houses. It's a fairly, uh, was uh, a, a fairly simple utilitarian structure. Sadly, this, this house was lost about 10 years ago. Uh, it was about 100 years, years old at the time. Uh, it was owned uh, by an African-American uh, you know, family who were one of the early uh, settlers in North Brentwood and built the house in, in, 19, in 1912. So uh, it's an interesting community, has an interesting story, and I believe that the, um, the class in the fall is going to continue that work as well. Another project that we did last fall uh, in Langley Park and the Adelphi uh, area, this is a PALS project. PALS is an acronym for Partners in Learning and Sustainability, and it's an ongoing cooperative agreement that the university has. Um, and we establish an agreement with localities. Uh, the project program's been around for 10 years or so, and during that time, we've had agreements with different, different organizations, usually counties, uh, sometimes cities, and currently our agreement is, is with the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission. So they identify historic preservation projects along with many other projects. This is not just historic preservation, uh, this is university-wide. So there are uh, units all across campus that are working on PAL, PALS projects at any given time. But we, uh, we of course, focus on the historic preservation ones. And so in the fall, uh, we identified two uh, projects in Prince George's County uh, that folks were very interested in learning more uh, about. And one of them was Langley Park and Adelphi. Langley Park uh, is a, uh, you know, a very changing uh, neighborhood, of course, uh, established a long time ago. So the Adelphi, Adelphi Mill that you see on the right, 18th century mill, is, represents the you know, traditional you know, history of the area from that time period. That, of course, has seen enormous change over the years. The, uh, the uh, McCormick Goodhart Mansion on the left is certainly another historic structure that people are probably fairly, fairly familiar with dating to 1924. But of course, these communities don't stand still. Um, and they, they grow and grow and change. And, uh, and, adult, and Langley Park has seen successive generations of different groups of, of, of people occupying them. So uh, at one point, it was a very, uh, uh, an African-American community, very strongly African-American. That has changed and more recently, uh, Latino community uh, and Asian-American community. And so this type of project is really interesting and a challenge for preservationists because you know, the folks that built uh, the Delphi Mill have been gone for a long time. Uh, and the folks that are living there now, they have a different perspective on, on what is important to them. And so that is one of the challenges that historic preservationists must address. How do we record and how do we take advantage of these other resources? Uh, that are not the typical ones that historic preservationists have dealt with in the past. So things like the Adelphi uh, you know, Shopping Center um, and all the different you know, residential areas that have grown up and changed over time. So this is a really interesting project. And uh, what the students did was they, they developed, uh, they did a, a, a survey of the area and they, did, uh, they developed a story map that presents the history of the area. And, and that is available um, maybe it's on the MP N NCPPC webpage, I don't know, but I know that it's on uh, the PALS and the University of Maryland webpages. So you all can take a look at that if you're interested. 
Another project that we did last fall, uh, again through PALS, was the Cedar Hill Cemetery in Capitol Heights. This is a design cemetery. It got going in the early 20th century, but then was uh, seriously redesigned in the 1930s. And so it's representative of that time period in terms of designed cemeteries. Interestingly, or probably you know, possibly most interesting is the fact that Dionisio Rodriguez, a Mexican-American uh, sculptor, was heavily involved in the layout of the cemetery in the 1930s. And he, uh, he was commissioned to create eight sculptures in the area that are still there today. One of them is the Bridge of Life that you can see on the right. Uh, Rodriguez is a very interesting artist in that he worked in concrete, reinforced concrete, uh, and it was called the Faubois style. So he uh, created uh, you know, sculptures uh, out of concrete that were meant to look like something else. Primarily, he made them look out like they were either stone uh, or wood. Um, and wood was his, his probably his most popular treatment. So you can see here on the left, he's standing in front of a hollow tree uh, that's made of concrete. And then the Bridge of Life is also meant to look like a wooden bridge, but of course it's concrete. Uh, and he did some really innovative uh, things. He dyed his concrete, tinted it colors. Uh, and so he's, he's well known. And there are a number of his uh, sculptures uh, across the country, very few of them on the East Coast. However, this is one of the best examples uh, that we know of uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, and so it's very significant. And so the, 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 the study, of course, focused a great deal you know, on, on his work as part of the larger study uh, of the significance of the cemetery. The Compton Bassett site, which you all probably know at least uh, something about, uh, down near uh, Upper Marlboro, a pretty amazing property. Uh, with a substantial uh, you know, late 18th century uh, mansion house and then a whole variety of outbuildings that was acquired by the county a number of years back. We've been working with them for about 10 years now through various student projects to help them document structures uh, on the property. Um, the county has been very generous to us and allowed uh, us, me primarily, to bring both my vernacular architecture class uh, and my building conservation class um, you know, out to Compton Bassett, you know, annually uh, so that we can use it, you know, as a, as a, as a textbook. So it's been great. Most, most recently, we've been working with them to digitally document um, the buildings on the property uh, so that we will have a higher level, the higher level of documentation uh, that we can. And in some instances, that's particularly important because the buildings are in uh, very poor condition. Um, there are many of them there. There's over a dozen, um, and it's it's a really a challenge for the county uh, to be able to uh, to to rehabilitate them. So this is an example. This uh, building on the left, the, the tenant house, um, it's on its last legs. It's probably not going to be saved. Um, it is a very interesting structure. It's probably built before the Civil War. Uh, may have been associated with slavery. We do not know that to be the case. But clearly, after the Civil War, it had a long lifespan as a tenant building, so it was adapted uh, for tenants to live there. And it's a really interesting example of hybrid heavy timber frame and balloon frame construction methods. So we're documenting that, and you see on the right is the scan, photo scan uh, from the laser scanning. <coughs> so from the laser scanning, we can uh, turn these into drawings, we can turn them into Revit models um, and do a whole variety of things with them. And the idea for Compton Bassett is that hopefully all of the scanning and all this material will someday make its way you know, into the public domain, um, you know, on uh, web pages and things like that, so that um, you know folks can actually see these buildings and appreciate them. Here's another one. This is a, a dairy. Uh, it's a late 18th century dairy that's that's very near the main house. You can see here. Uh, it's in much better shape uh, than the tenant house. Uh, and I know that the county, uh, Brian Carroll, is, is making plans right now uh, to begin work on the dairy um, you know, to, to, to make repairs. So again, the scan on the right <coughs> is uh, taken from uh, the digital camera. But the benefit of the digital camera, of course, is that you can do all sorts of things with it. So here's an example of taking uh, you know, those scans and rotating it. Uh, and taking it apart. So here we've, they've actually lifted the roof off the top of the building 
so you can see you know inside the structure so this is just one example of you know again you can you you can manipulate these images and you can use them in ways that obviously you know hand measured um, images simply can't be done so this is an ongoing project and we have great hopes that we will continue to work with this and we're in uh, conversations with folks in, in parks and planning uh, to do this type of scanning at other properties in the county as well. We had a couple of very interesting projects this spring. Uh, these were not actually PALS projects. Uh, they came out of PALS type communication, but they turned into just a directed research opportunities for individual students. So uh, Joe Tanier, one of our dual degree architecture students, um, and so this came from coming from the county and interest in learning more about the Peace Cross. Certainly there's a lot known about the Peace Cross. A lot has been said about the Peace Cross, especially in the last few years, <clears throat> given the legal battle over, over it and its presence there on public land. But what we wanted to do is get behind that story and learn more about the story of the Peace Cross, um, how and why it was built and how it has been used you know, over the almost 100, 100 years uh, that the Peace Cross has been there. And the idea again is that this information uh, will be made available to the county. Um, certainly, uh, and certainly this is also a part of the idea that they are beginning plans to make, to restore the Peace Cross, to be working on it. So it's part of the idea <clears throat> of making sure that we know everything that we should know about the, the uh, structure before that work begins. And the second project, uh, this is the Concord Plantation uh, up in Capitol Heights. And this came about because, again, the county is in the midst of developing a master plan for use and interpretation of the, of the site. And so uh, we worked with them and, and they uh, essentially reached out that they were interested in having research done on especially the enslaved community uh, there and their descendants. And so that is what uh, we've been working on uh, this, last, uh, this last semester. So Devin Murtha has undertaken uh, that research and so, so she has uh, delved into <clears throat> the documentary record, um, you know, census records and a whole variety of sources um, you know, to get that basic information. What do we know about the enslaved community there during the Berry period um, and then afterwards, of course, and how do we make the leap from before the Civil War to after the Civil War to be able to you know, trace these folks and to understand the communities uh, that they developed. So the main house, uh, 1789, it has a service wing uh, that you can see the, the first step on the left, which has been dendro dated uh, to 1859. Um, and while it has been altered you know, over time, uh, it is remarkably well-preserved. It is probably one of the best examples uh, of a service wing from slavery days uh, that exists in Prince George's County. And the picture on the right is showing the kitchen. So it had a large kitchen room on the first floor, uh, a pantry next to it, and then above were two rooms uh, that we believe were the quarters for the enslaved uh, folks, uh, the cook, uh, presumably, and, and, and other household servants uh, who worked and served the berries in the main house. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, and again, uh, <clears throat> looking for interpretive opportunities you know, at the site, uh, certainly this is something that I that we hope and we think will be tremendously beneficial, you know, to the county. There are other outbuildings. Uh, here are two of them. This is a stable on the left, the corn house on the right. They've they've both been dendro dated as well to the 1850s. So the service wing and these buildings and a tobacco barn, they were all part of a major building campaign that occurred in the decade of the 1850s uh, before the Civil War. Uh, I'll be taking students out to this site in a couple of weeks and we will be uh, hand measuring these two buildings uh, because learning how to hand measure uh, is a tremendously important skill for students to have. Doesn't matter how fancy your cameras are and if you've got labor, lasers and whatnot, if you don't know how to read a building and understand how they were constructed, um, you're not really gonna be able to, 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 to understand them. So we'll, we will be doing that in the, in the next couple coming weeks. And finally, I want to announce um, every year uh, we present the Prince George's Heritage Award to one of our students. And this award goes to a student who has been particularly active in working with local communities in Prince George's County. 
And so I'm happy to announce that Devin Murtha, a first year MHP student with us, uh, has received this award. And the reason for that is because of her uh, research on the Concord Plantation. And she was also a part of the team that worked on the Cedar Hill Cemetery uh, work as well. So we feel that she was highly deserving of this prestigious award uh, in your name. And that's enough for me. Thanks. Uh, thank you, um, Dennis, that was great. Uh, there's a lot of content there and we certainly can circle back at the end if there are any specific questions about lots of the uh, things that you mentioned. So um, I think without any fanfare, we will now proceed to hear from Donna Schneider, who is the president of the Prince George's County Historical Society and Library, who has no visual presentation, but has some remarks to share. Take it away, Donna. Thank you, Howard. Well, um, as we all know, since last year's reception, it has been a unprecedented and historical year. Um, as a result, the society's activities were curtailed, um, and especially since we can't, uh, we couldn't open our um, Frederick DeMar Library for the public's use. Um, however, our historian, Susan Pearl, has spent a lot of time answering inquiries that we have received by email. And if you, anybody does have any inquiries or any questions for us, do not hesitate to contact us at info at pghistory.org. We will do our best to try and answer your questions. Um, every once in a while, Susan doesn't have the information at hand, so she might not be able to completely answer your question, but she'll, be, she'll do her best. Um, and we still do not know when our library will be reopening, but hopefully as the county continues to reopen, we will be able to reopen soon as well. One of the things that we did continue to do during um, the last year is partner with um, uh, Maryland Milestones, Anacostia Trails Heritage Area, and, our, and the Marietta House Museum on various lectures. We always enjoy this relationship and look forward to working with Megan going forward on any um, um, projects or events that um, they would like to join or have us join with them. Um, and it's a great benefit that we provide to our members as well. In February 2021, um, the Historical Society started a um, history chat. It's a one hour Zoom call on the fourth Monday of the month at 7 p.m. Um, these conversations have been a fairly um, a big hit, um, and we will. Uh, and they are on a wide range of topics. Um, we we kicked off the series with a chat um, with Maya Davis and discussing the Maryland archives. Uh, Dr. Jeff, Jennifer Stabler um, chatted about cemeteries in the county. Uh, Joseph Pruden reminisced about. Growing up in Chevrolet and uh, during the 19th, late 1950s and throughout the 60s. And um, our latest presentation in May was with uh, Professor William Thomas about um, his new book, uh, Question of Freedom, The Families Who Challenged Slavery from the Nation's Founding to the Civil War. And in his book, he talks about several families that were here in, the, in uh, Prince George's County. Um, our June chat will be about um, African American genealogy with um, Nathania Branch Miles. In July, um, we will be chatting about the historic, uh, the county's historic preservation grant program. And then in August, we will meet the new director. Well, he's not so new anymore. He's been around for about a year now, but the new director of the College Park Aviation Museum, Kevin Cabrera. So I hope you can join us. Um, also, 2021 is the 325th anniversary of the founding of Prince George's County. Um, to commemorate that, commemorate that in just a small way, is the Society has been posting on a weekly basis on our Facebook page tidbits about the county's history. Um, hopefully, before, this, before the end of the year, we will actually be able to all get together and celebrate um, the county's 325th birthday in some way. Um, of course, for more information about the Historical Society, please visit our website, which is www.pghistory.org, um, or our Facebook page. 
Um, and I hope the other co-sponsors don't mind me saying this, but um, we definitely do appreciate your support of our activities um, throughout the year, both in the past and the future, and the virtual attendance for at tonight's reception. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, that was great. Um, our next presentation comes to us from uh, some colleagues of ours in the Department of Parks and Recreation. And uh, I think we're going to hear both from Ed Day, who's the lead historic preservation officer um, in the Natural and Historical Resources Division, as well as Brian Carroll, who is the historic asset and project coordinator uh, in the Department of Parks and Recreation, about what the department has been doing with the traditionally uh, publicly accessible uh, portfolio of historic sites and resources um, during this time of uh, essential closure. I, I'm sure they've been taking significant advantage of the <clears throat> lack of uh, accessibility to get a lot of things done across the portfolio. And I think that's probably what we're about to hear about. So um, take it away, Brian. Um, we're actually tag teaming tonight, uh, okay. Howard. Okay. Brian um, and Ed. But 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 I it, I do have um, one one comment to make. I've been asked on the side whether or not I'm keeping within the spirit of the uh, historic preservation reception, and I just just want to show you that yes, I am. Um, and that, that goes for all the people that normally go to these things. Here's to you. Thanks for supporting historic preservation. Hopefully you have a glass of wine yourself, and this is going to be kind of hopefully enlightening and entertaining at the same time. As Howard mentioned, I'm Ed Day, Chief Preservation Officer from the National Historical Resources Division, Department of Parks and Rec. And I'm tag teaming on this wrestling match with Brian Carroll, who's an AIA registered architect, and he's former a historic Preservation Commissioner in Montgomery County, and it's always fun to work with him. Uh, Gina Vaughn, who's our other colleague and partner in crime, could not make it for this, and I think she's listening in, so we wanted to give her a shout out. She's um, doing, uh, I think, a school function with her son. Um, in 2020, we talked about our substantial investment in our 46 accessible, uh, accessible properties and our extensive portfolio of 180 plus resources. Uh, we related that to our 2017-2018 assessment to start funding and, and start to preserve these structures uh, in, in a more meaningful way than just sort of whack-a-mole. I want to give kudos to Chris Fanning, our, our division chief, who really got that across the finish line at that point. Um, we discussed the formation of our Historic Preservation Maintenance Unit, of which Brian leads and Gina is with him. And we have Elmer Chavez, Kevin William, John Hickox, and even Don Graham, who you might mention, might, might uh, remember from Montpelier Mansion, uh, is working with us on small projects now. And then our Historic Preservation Coordinating Group, which coordinates across five different divisions. And um, we meet every Wednesday. Gina leads, Gina Vaughn leads the group. And we discuss all these projects that we're working on. Um, we also discussed some work at Compton Bassett, Abraham Hall, Newton White, the Chelsea Barn, Riversdale, Marietta. Um, some of those projects we discussed last year were initiated before the pandemic, but we moved on in 2020 into 2021. Um, Brian has a list of sites that he's going to show in just a second. 12 sites, 37 different projects that we've been working on. Um, and uh, we continue to work even with the pandemic. And so we're going to show you some of that tonight. So my job is to get Brian really excited um, <laughs> and show you some of the things he's discovered as we've done some of this work. So Brian, you want to lead us through this real quick? Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. It's been an interesting year. Um, I'm sure everyone knows it's, uh, you know, it's not what everyone expected. It's uh, had some paradoxical benefits, as um, Howard said, that uh, suddenly all of these buildings that we own are empty. Uh, and I don't expect anyone to be able to read this timeline, uh, but I wanted to throw it up here just to uh, show along the bottom of the timeline that the, the sites that we own span 1740 to about 1947, um, the historic sites that we're working on. The, the next slide is the same thing. I don't expect you to read all of it, but we started to put together a partial list of the projects that we were able to do in this last year. And as, as I was writing it, I realized that we've left off a bunch of stuff that we haven't done. So it's been a very good year for just making things happen. We've had unlimited access to the buildings. 
Um, so I want to start off with uh, this was a project that fought <laughs> fought Gina every step of the way. Uh, logistically, every, everything that could go wrong went wrong, uh, and she wrestled it to the ground. She got it done. Um, the roof was failing at Billingsley. It was uh, leaking into the house. That you know, it was a thousand points of light when you went inside. You could see through the roof. Um, we took it off. There is original sheathing on the roof, or as, as near as we can tell, original sheathing on the roof. Uh, there were some repairs that had to be done, um, but in in total, the the thing was in great shape. Um, and um, so, new copper flashing, new cedar roof, and then this is my next slide, which is just gratuitous roof photos, because you need those. So it it just the roof came out looking really nice. They did a great job with this one. Uh, on the same building, uh, different contractors, uh, there was a chimney that had been knocked down. Um, I don't remember whether this was a tree or lightning, um, but it was there was a, a matching chimney on the other end of the building. Uh, this had been down for quite some time. So while we had the scaffolding up, we took advantage of it and had a contractor um, build the chimney to uh, duplicate what, what had been there. Um, and what you're looking at is the chimney is not finely washed, so it, it blends better, but this is right right after construction. So um, a nice thing to get back up there and get the building back intact. Um, we've had an ongoing relationship with the um, Kettering Largo Boys and Girls Club. They lease um, Chelsea from us, and uh, as we're going through and trying to just restore the building, uh, we've had some you know, there, we went through a period where we were doing the HVAC and the electrical and the plumbing, and it doesn't show very well, uh, but we've had some things, we've been able to do some things this year that show a lot better. So you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, the building is really starting to look nice. So uh, starting to make some good headway there. Um, Oxen Hill Manor, uh, there are some, some really beautiful windows in the, uh, in the building, but the um, the sills were starting to fail. Uh, they were trapping water and directing it back into the building. Um, some of the sash were coming apart. Uh, we had Worcester Eisenbrink come in and they took 32 windows out of the building, restored the frames, um, got the, the sills so that they're shedding water again. They salvaged as much original material as they could and the windows look fantastic and they actually operate. They're, you know, fully functioning windows now. They're nice and tight. They open, close, so, all right. Um, this was fun. There was a, uh, there's a seal over the front and back door at Oxen Hill Manor that um, when we inspected it, it was, it was failing and it was made out of some kind of composite foam. So it was not original to the, um, to the house. So we had, um, again, Worcester Eisenbring came out, they made casts of the, um, the seal that was up there, uh, made us a few replicas, painted them up for us. And now over the front and back door, we have these new, um, much more solid um, seals. And you can see that the um, surround for the front door has been completely renovated. It's been completely um, you know, filled and uh, cleaned up and painted, and it looks like a million bucks. Uh, we have needed for a while to get at the the steps on the Riverdale uh, House Museum. The the steps had been spalling; they'd been repaired a number of times, uh, and we had a contractor come in. Uh, they inventoried what was there salvaged everything that they could. Where we couldn't salvage pieces, we had new um, new limestone steps, treads made in the same pattern of the uh, the existing ones and then pieced them in. So everything's been cleaned and uh, it's all sealed up again and uh, the steps look really great. So. This is a, a recent one and this is uh, this is my uh, I joke that this is one of the places where I get my preservation geek on. Um, we started to uh, do the renovation of uh, Snow Hill Manor and we were look we had a company come in and take out the windows and the, the four windows you see across the front of the building are mirrored on the back of the building. 
Uh, so there's eight of these large uh, double hung windows. And when they took the paint off of them, what you're looking at uh, on, the, on the right and uh, the top uh, in the center are, uh, this is an oak plank frame window. So instead of this molding in the center being actually carved, you know, being applied to the window, the wood to the left of this molding was just removed in order to leave the molding there. So all of this is a solid piece of wood. And when you look at the, the photo on the right, you can see when the paint is removed that there's actually the ghost mark from an old hinge, uh, an HL hinge or something uh, on the, and the uh, staining from the iron on the oak. So these are these beautiful white oak frames that we uncovered here. You can see the photo in the center on the bottom. Not all of them are in great shape. Um, we're having some new parts made. They're, they're salvaging everything that they can. But um, I would have assumed that these were applied moldings. Um, but these are, these are really spectacular window frames. Um, I don't know. Uh, Brian, if, can I can I just can I can I just say something about this so I can I'm gonna brag on you. Um, so this is a bungalow along Riverdale Road, and if you're familiar with the area, it's diagonally across from um, the Riverdale Elementary School. Um, this 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 particular structure was in such bad condition that our rental property unit just didn't want to have anything to do with it. They they were kind of voting for demo, but we realized it was a contributing structure. And Brian came through with a plan and and just really made a, a silk purse out of I wouldn't even say a sow's ear at this point. So I just wanted you guys to know that this thing was so far gone. Um, nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. Eleven people had lived in it at one point at the same time. Um, it had you know lead abatement, all kinds of stuff that had to be done. So Brian, go ahead and take it away. But I, I you know you did a great job on this. I was just going to say that I don't know uh, if all of you know, but Ed has retired as head of Riversdale uh, after 25 years, Ed? Yeah, Is 1994. Yeah, yeah, 1994. 25 years. Ed needed a place to land, so uh, we had to make him a nice office. So uh, there's a couple of offices in here for he and Chris Fanning. There's uh, some space that we're going to be able to use as meeting space in the, in the rear. So. Um, a nice, a nice little building, a little jewel box. Hey Brian, can you show the the picture on the the pictures on the right of that particular front uh, parlor space? This, I'm sorry, yeah. what are you? What are you? It's the same room. It's the same oh, room. Yeah, this, this is before and after. Two, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It was really terrible. Uh, you know, the the typical '80s shag carpet and so forth over really beautiful hardwood floors. Um, one of the nice things that we did, and this is sort of a before picture in the center on the bottom, is on the um, the outside of the house, there's some um, what are probably cement asbestos shingles. But in the rear, uh, there's an addition, and what we exposed in the back is a novelty siding. It's a double drop siding. So we kept that exposed in this rear room where we'll be able to have some meeting space. Uh, you know, cleaned it up and painted it. But I'm assuming that that's what's under the rest of the siding on the on the rest of the house. And uh, hopefully someday we can uh, take that cement asbestos off and put the right siding back on here. And this is, I just wanted to finish on this. I, I, don't, I don't know how many people know about this barn. Uh, this is way down in the back of the Compton Bassett property. It's been a real worry for a long time. Um, if you look at the photo on the upper left-hand uh, side, a tree grew up, this is, predates me at the commission, but it grew up through the side of the building and lifted a beam out of the side of the building. So all of the, the floor joists on the second floor were just uh, cantilevered out in space. Um, the corner was gone. Uh, the building was looking really sad, and we had some people come in. Uh, this is these are very recent photos. Uh, they stabilized the barn. They got it back up. We got new siding on it and a roof on it. So the roof is uh, the barn is safe for for the time being. Now we we're able to save everything inside of it. There's some really beautiful uh, mm -hmm. timber frame joinery inside of this barn. And without further ado. 
That's it. I just wanted to say thank you. It's been it's been a great year. It's been incredibly busy, but it's been a really fun year. Uh, it really has thanks. been. I think we worked harder this year. Um, I would like to say one more thing, uh, Brian. Thank you so much. It's been it's been a, a wild ride, like you say, and had lots of partners. Dennis, your team, as you mentioned, you know, uh, Brian's been down there faithfully at the gate to let you in Compton Bassett. You may even have your own key right now. I won't say that out loud. I didn't say that. Um, but it, it's been a it's been a great ride. And and one other thing I want to add, and I don't know if uh, Alfonso Narvaez is on this call on this uh, meeting or not. Uh, one of the things we want to do in the future, um, not only is restore these things, but also train staff. And uh, so we're putting together a training program with Alfonso, you know, my friend and yours. And we're going to go in and um, bring the Department of Parks and Rec staff in and talk to them about the elements of architecture and what it means to uh, be stewards of these wonderful properties. So we're getting things fixed and we're getting smarter. And I'm, I'm thinking the, the, the future looks pretty bright. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And I just wanted to say just one thing is that uh, we are really going to miss Dennis Pope, that the, the partnership yeah. um, has allowed us to, I mean, just just tangible things like the digital documentation of Compton Bassett is going to, uh, you know, we're going to reap the benefits of that for years to come. But it's really the ability to see these sites through Dennis's eyes that has been so remarkable for me. And, and has really helped me. So it's it's really a loss, and we hope that uh, we hope you won't be a stranger. We we applaud you, Dennis. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Um, I'll still be around. I like doing what I do. So <laughs> good. Great. Thank you, Brian and Ed, for a terrific presentation. Um, this comes under the heading of every cloud has a silver lining. Uh, these properties got a, a year off from their public responsibilities and uh, the benefits are obvious. So if we could get away with doing this periodically, that would be wonderful, but obviously we know that that's not realistic. So, you know, should normal life return, uh, this work will undoubtedly go on, but it will never be as easy as it was in the last year. But uh, we're here to support you in, in that to the extent that we can always. Uh, so our last presentation this evening um, is a summary of the year in review for the Planning Department's Historic Preservation Section and by extension uh, the work of the county's appointed Historic Preservation Commission. And we'll have two presenters I believe this evening. Uh, we'll start with Tom Gross who um, will then uh, take you through a bunch of projects that we've been involved in over the last year and then we'll conclude uh, hopefully with some remarks uh, on archaeological efforts uh, by Dr. Jennifer Stabler and once that presentation is concluded we can certainly open the microphones for questions and deal with what's in the chat to the extent that we uh, want to address those questions more fully if they haven't already been addressed. So uh, Tom it's your uh, okay. slideshow. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and I hope you all can see the screen. Yeah, again, my name is Tom Gross. I'm a planner coordinator with the Historic Preservation Section uh, in the Planning Department. And just to echo things that have already been said by um, really everyone that's spoken before, um, if you haven't gotten this by now, um, you know, the world that we inhabit in Historic Preservation in Prince George's County is is somewhat close-knit and yet we're open to all comers and so um, you've heard different presenters talk about the collaborations uh, between their organizations and other organizations and the planning department is certainly no exception i mean uh, whether it's uh, at the maryland milestones who was a uh, applicant i believe last year for one of our non-capital grants and who of course megan's predecessor was a member of our historic preservation commission um, and so there was by default a close relationship between our two organizations. Uh, the University of Maryland, uh, we've had the opportunity to work with um, Dennis and students in the program on several of the PALS projects that uh, were discussed including the Adelphi Langley Park and the Cedar Hill Cemetery project and those have just been a lot of fun and really not a lot of work for us uh, which is great. Um, and then uh, the, the Historical Society, um, it's, it's been great to uh, participate just as 
an attendee personally at some of these uh, events, virtual events that have um, taken off in the past few months, like the uh, the history chats. And I know some uh, historic preservation section staff have been recruited as speakers for those, which is great. Um, and of course, our colleagues with the Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, who we meet with uh, on a monthly basis, um, you know, whether we need to or not typically, but also uh, at, at different times um, throughout the year. And, and it's great that we have a great working relationship uh, with them. And I also want to note that, um, as Howard said, we, we hope that next year uh, we can all be together to celebrate Preservation Month. Um, but I, I know I'm not the only one who appreciates uh, some of the opportunities that this virtual world has afforded. You know, for example, I know that as I gaze out in the audience and they're hiding behind the anonymity of their deactivated cameras, but we have, for example, uh, the uh, current chairman of the, um, of the Historic Preservation Commission, John Peter Thompson, uh, who would of course be at these events, but we have the first chairman of the Prince George's County Historic Preservation Commission, Alan Verda. He thinks he's hiding, but I saw him there and he continues to be a great resource for me and, and Jennifer and others on the staff. So it's great that this kind of format can allow that kind of participation. Um, as Howard said, I just wanna uh, take you through a few of the things uh, that we've been working on in the historic preservation section over the past year. Pandemic or not, our work has continued pace and that's really because we're largely a reactive organization and the entities to which we react have, have continued to operate whether that's developers um, seeking to build things in the county whether it's historic site or resource owners who want to perform work on their property uh, or whether it's property owners that want to see their properties evaluated for historic site designation or apply for grants uh, of one type or another. So um, as long as we have things to, to, to work on, we continue to work. So just a few um, kind of top line numbers to go through at first. This map you can see, uh, this comes from our great PG Atlas mapping uh, app, uh, which you can visit at pgatlas.com. All these dark blue icons represent our 456 now locally designated historic sites. This is up from 452 when we gathered last year. The light blue icons are our 88 unclassified historic resources. Um, that number has gone down um, since uh, last year because uh, resources are either evaluated and deleted from the inventory or they are, thank you, Megan, or are uh, evaluated and made historic sites. So that number will continue to go down, although those of us um, that have spent any time in, uh, in Colonial Williamsburg feel like there's a magic related to the number 88. Um, we have four locally designated historic districts. Um, there are a number of National Register historic districts uh, in the county, but we have four locally designated ones, and these are districts over which the, um, the Historic Preservation Commission has regulatory authority. Our most uh, active and, and vibrant one, if I can use that term, is the Old Town College Park Historic District, and we've got uh, representatives of the local advisory committee um, from College Park joining us this evening. We're also very uh, excited and happy that the Broad Creek Historic District, which is uh, the county's oldest locally designated historic district, uh, has now a reconstituted local advisory committee um, to uh, that, that will be able to weigh in on historic area work permits and development applications for properties within and adjacent to the Broad Creek District. So that's exciting. Uh, we have 100 National Register listings. We have 18 now National Register Historic Districts. I will talk about the changes to that number in a few minutes. And six National Historic Landmarks. One of the things that we do in the section is evaluate properties for potential designation as historic sites. And over the past year, we have had four such evaluations. and um, I, I'm, I, it, it's great that we have these four to talk about because they highlight a few of the different ways that historic sites can come into being in the county. Uh, we'll start with the Toping Castle site up in Greenbelt. And this came to us because it was a historic resource that had been designated through a sector plan several years ago. And a developer had put forward a development application 
uh, for, uh, for, for new development on this property. That triggered the evaluation of the Toping Castle site to determine whether it should become a county historic site. And with that, all of the considerations of um, buffering and, and uh, adjacency that come with that. So I just wanna lead you through a little bit of the history of these historic sites, starting with the Toping Castle. I'm not gonna say too much about this one uh, because Dr. Stabler um, is going to speak more about it. And it is at this point, largely an archeological endeavor rather than uh, a preservation concern. Um, but Toping Castle, uh, if you're not familiar with it, began uh, in the 1740s as a large oak log house that was built by uh, Isaac Walker and his brothers, Charles and Nathan. Uh, according to family history, the Walker brothers had fled Scotland with a bounty on their heads for participation in the Jacobite rebellion. And uh, if you look at the history of this property, you'll see that military service in the, serve, in, in the name of uh, rebellion or fighting against um, enemies real or perceived is a common theme. Um, this house was built, we, we, we know uh, there's documentation that they built a dwelling at the headwaters of Bear Garden Branch, which is now Indian Creek. Um, Charles and Nathan Walker left Toping Castle soon after the construction of the house, but Isaac continued to live there with his wife, Elizabeth. Uh, Isaac and Elizabeth's son, Nathan, who was born in 1756, uh, reportedly was responsible for the farm while his father and his brothers fought in the American Revolution. Nathan himself would go on to join the revolutionary cause, uh, serving with his brothers in Captain Thomas Bell's company of the Upper Battalion of Militia in Prince George's County. Uh, Samuel Hamilton was a son of uh, the, the, the second Nathan Hamilton. He was uh, born in 1817. Uh, he enlisted in the Washington City Volunteers in 1836, by the way, that's his photograph that you see on the slide right there. And he fought in the Second Seminole War. He later headed to Texas where he gained notoriety as a Texas Ranger, the original Walker Texas Ranger. He fought against the Mexican invasion of Texas was captured and involved in the so-called Mir Expedition, which this is something I have to Google and, and, and thank you to Dr. Stabler. I'm, I'm reading directly from her uh, evaluation of the property. Uh, I, I, I confess, I don't know much about the Mir Expedition or the uh, black bean incident where Texans were forced to choose between black or white beans to survive. So uh, if you don't know about that, uh, like I do, I'm sure you'll be looking for more information soon. Uh, Sam Walker was also integral in the development of Samuel Colt's revolver. Um, Samuel Walker was killed in action in October of 1847. He was interred in San Antonio's Old City Cemetery before being reburied uh, in 1856 at an Odd Fellow Cemetery. Uh, Tobin Castle passed through various uh, um, succeeding generations of the Walker family until it was finally sold out of the family in 1933. It was on property that was part of uh, the, the land that was purchased uh, for the federal government's development of the Greenbelt community. This particular part of uh, that property was not developed um, and the Tobin Castle property uh, was eventually uh, passed back into private hands and the house itself was demolished at some point in the 1960s. Uh, so now it just sort of sits, there's, there's foundation remains that sit within a wooded area. Um, and like I said, it's largely uh, an archeological site at this point. And so Dr. Stabler is going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, moving on, the Thomas Seabrook House in Lanham. This was a historic resource. Um, it came uh, to us for evaluation because a recent um, owner of the property, the current owner of the property bought it recently and was planning certain uh, alterations to the exterior, certain work to the exterior, which triggered the evaluation. Um, this was an interesting case uh, for us because in staff's uh, assessment, we, uh, we concluded that it had lost too much of its integrity to merit designation as a historic site. And that was our recommendation to the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the property owner, however, felt very strongly that it did meet the criteria. And he uh, showed up at the Historic Preservation Commission meeting in February and stated his case. And by golly, he, 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 uh, he prevailed. 
And so this is now a historic site, and we are happy for that, and we look forward to working uh, with him. The Thomas Seabrook House, uh, just to give you a little bit of, of the history, is a uh, house built in 1880 in the Carpenter Gothic style. If you look at the picture, some of the details that are now missing are some decorative barge boards in that steep gable and, and in the other gable as well. Uh, the windows have been uh, replaced um, with, with modern vinyl windows. This porch uh, that you see on the side elevation here and the addition behind it are all relatively recent. And so that, that detracts somewhat from the original massing of the house, uh, although both are potentially reversible. Um, Mr. Seabrook was a civil engineer for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, this house was built in the community that bears his name, a map of which you see here. Uh, you can see Thomas Seabrook has, has um, two houses associated with him on Dewberry Avenue. Actually, the other little square there on Dewberry Avenue is the third house uh, that Seabrook built right around the same time. And so this is one of a trio of houses that Seabrook built right around 1880. Uh, we have the Thomas Seabrook House, now a historic site, uh, the Seabrook Cottage, which is also a historic site, and the Kelly Cottage, further east on Dewberry Avenue, which is also a county historic site. Um, Mr. Seabrook used this house as a summer residence until 1897. And uh, since then, or, or since 1912, it has been um, outside of the family but kept in uh, relatively intact despite, the, um, despite the, the alterations that I mentioned. And as I said, we look forward to working with the property owner on the, the, uh, um, on the restoration of this house. Uh, moving on to two properties in Hyattsville. Uh, this one and the next one came uh, to our attention because they were applicants for the Historic Property Grant Program. And to participate in the grant program or to use the, the funds that are awarded to you, a property must be designated as a historic site. So if you receive a, you don't have to be a historic site to apply for the grant, but if you are awarded one, the evaluation process must proceed. And so this house, the Joan Sheridan House, is one of those uh, in Hyattsville. It had actually been documented before as the John J. Moeller House, and you can find an MIHP form uh, for the house under that name. But what we discovered uh, in our research on the property is that Moeller, while he was the first private owner of the property after the, uh, the subdividing developers sold it, did not actually build the house. And, and the house was not uh, actually built until uh, about a decade later when um, it was owned by a gentleman named Arthur Carr, who sold it shortly thereafter to Philip Jones. And his family was the first, uh, not the first owner occupants, but the first owner occupants of any duration. They lived there almost 20 years. Uh, thereafter, the property was sort of carved up as a boarding house uh, for, the, for the most of the 20th century, as a matter of fact. And it remained a rental property until the 18, uh, sorry, the 1980s or perhaps the 1990s until it was purchased by its current owner, Mr. Sheridan, in 2001. And he has set himself to restoring this property to its historic appearance and using it as his primary residence. So it is in deference to his ambitions for the property that the name Jones Sheridan House uh, was applied uh, for this historic site. And we look forward to working with him uh, on his grant funded projects. The other house in Hyattsville uh, that this applies to is the Heerling House, a little bit farther north on Oglethorpe Street. Um, this property, unlike the Jones Sheridan House, has had very few owners. Uh, it was purchased, or the property was purchased in the mid 1920s by Edward and Nora Heerling. It's not exactly clear whether they built the house shortly after purchasing it or whether the developer, J. Moses Edlovich, had, bought, uh, had built the house and then sold it to the Heerlings. In any event, uh, the Heerlings occupied the house from the 1920s until the 1960s, when it was sold to two brothers, uh, Thomas and Carol Houchins, and it was owned by them or their heirs uh, until 2018, when it was uh, sold to the current owner. And the current owner, again, was an applicant for the Historic Property Grant Program, and, um, and we look forward to working uh, with, with him on, on this project to restore this, this bungalow, which is very typical of uh, dwellings that were built at that time. So those are uh, the four um, new historic sites that we have in the county. Just to mention very briefly, National Register Historic Districts. 
when we gathered last year, there were two pending National Register uh, Historic Districts, the Moyone Reserve and Cheverly. We're happy to say now that as of October of last year, uh, the Moyone Reserve in Akakik is now a National Register Historic District. This is uh, an effort that was initiated by the Moyone Association, a citizen-led uh, group in the Moyone. Uh, you can see here a couple of the mid-century uh, houses um, that exemplify the, the architecture of the reserve. Um, the, the Wagner House on the top there that was built in the late 1940s and then the later Odell House built in the 1970s down at the bottom. You can see on the map the, uh, the historic district encompasses five original subdivisions of the Moyon Reserve. So we're very happy to see that become a National Register Historic District. Uh, and we are to be equally excited uh, when the Chevrolet National Register Historic District is actually listed. Uh, it is not at this point. The work continues to uh, fully document the history of this, uh, of this district. Um, I had the opportunity to actually drive through there um, today as part of a uh, uh, historic resource evaluation. And it really is um, obviously a, uh, an, an interesting part of the county and the Sears houses that you see and the other houses of that period that you see are very interesting. Uh, but the reason that this is taking so long is that um, they want to make sure that all parts of Chevrolet and all parts of its history are adequately accounted for in the nomination. So that effort continues. This, uh, by the way, is being led by uh, the town itself. Uh, they, were, they were the applicants for a planning department, um, not, not us in historic preservation, but through the community uh, planning division, a PAMC grant, planning assistance for municipalities and communities grant to uh, prepare a National Register nomination. So hopefully that will be uh, coming soon. Uh, it was another active year for the Historic Property Grant Program. Um, we had, uh, again, I believe it was 13 or 14 applicants this year, which um, just about matched what we had in 20, uh, for, for the previous year in 20, um, 2019. So the grants, the applications were actually due in 2020. The awards were made in 2021. Um, so as I said, people are still interested in performing uh, work on their properties. And we know the pandemic has caused certain challenges with contractors and sourcing of materials, um, but we are happy to provide this assistance. And we're happy that the planning board uh, has, has continued to support this program uh, with its funding. It's met, uh, we had $350,000 to award in this cycle. The program, as always, was oversubscribed, so difficult decisions had to be made by the grant committee and the HPC and the planning board. Uh, but you can see 10 projects were chosen for uh, awards, some at their full request, some at um, somewhat reduced uh, levels based on their, their ranking. Um, I won't go through all of the projects uh, that have been awarded, um, but you see some that are probably familiar may be familiar to you, some that uh, are, are less so. Uh, we're excited about them all, um, but the, um, there are several repeat customers, if you will, to the grant program, uh, including Pleasant Prospect. Uh, they have received funding this year for restoration of their entry door and the window and the fascia and installation of gutters and downspouts. Um, Mulliken's Delight is, is a current, um, is, is a existing grant recipient. They have received funds in this cycle to repair and correct foundation water damage. Uh, the Burgess House is a relatively recent, uh, recently designated historic site in Hyattsville. This is their second grant award, and this uh, award this year is for the second phase of their historic window restoration. Uh, Ashland Hay Barn, again, has received a grant in the past. This is to continue structural repairs to the barn, uh, focusing on the north and south bearing walls. Claggett House at Cool Spring Manor, uh, again, a repeat customer. The funding that they received in the cycle will support restoration of the door jam, plaster and stucco on the upper floor walls, and, and some other items as well. 3215 uh, Perry Street, this is a property like uh, the two uh, new designations that I was talking about that is not currently a historic site, but because they have received a grant, we are now in the process of evaluating them for potential historic site 
uh, designation so that they can avail themselves of those funds. They applied for and were awarded a grant for window restoration, exterior drainage and regrading, and some other items. The Teed House we told you about last year as one of our most recent historic site designations. They were designated, they applied for this grant um, cycle, and they have received funds uh, for work uh, to improve drainage uh, on the property and foundation work. St. John's Broad Creek has, has uh, been a grant recipient in the past. Their award this year will go towards uh, interior plaster, repair and cleaning biogrowth in the exterior masonry. Grace United Methodist Church uh, in Hyattsville will receive funds for a new HVAC system. And the William Stanley Wormley House uh, will receive funds for foundation repair work. So we're very happy uh, with this new crop of grant awardees and we look forward to working with them on their projects. I just have down here at the bottom just to give you a sense of where we've come since last year. Since May of 2020, since we last gathered, uh, $193,000 and change has been reimbursed through the grant program. Those aren't th those represent projects that were awarded grants one, two, three, or more years ago, but they've done the work, applied for reimbursement, and those funds have actually been issued. Non-capital grant program, which was quite new when we met last year, uh, continues to be uh, reasonably active, although we are always looking for new applicants for it. The two projects that have received funding through the non-cap program in the past year are actually um, follow-ons to, to projects that were awarded funds last year. So the old Greenbelt Theater was awarded an additional $25,000 for architectural plans uh, to support their um, the, 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 the film center that they plan to occupy the space adjacent to the Greenbelt Theater and for uh, other display and event space. Um, a smaller award was issued to the Moyon Reserve, who, as I mentioned last year, uh, was, um, was uh, given, sorry, was, was made a National Register Historic District. Now that they are an NRHD, they'd like to advertise that to the world. And so they applied for what we call a mini grant uh, of, of just over $1,200 for a bronze sign uh, indicating that they are now a National Register Historic District. So that's great. Uh, we also have our popular uh, incentive, the Preservation Tax Credit, which any historic site can avail themselves to if their work is, is approved through the Historic Area Work Permit process. Uh, it was a big year for the tax credit. Um, I can say that this number, this figure of about $442,000 in tax relief that was awarded in the past year, is about $300,000 more than the previous year. Now, that seems like a lot, and it is, but it can all be accounted for by really one block in, in the county, and that is Howard Lane in, in College Park. And those, those of you from College Park are very aware of these projects. The two houses that you see in the bottom pictures here are newly constructed houses that were built on a newly developed um, street between two existing streets in, um, in Old Town College Park. These houses required review through the Historic Area Work Permit process, uh, review by not only the HPC, but the Old Town College Park Historic District Local Advisory Committee. And because they were approved through the HAWP process, they were eligible for 10% uh, preservation tax credits. So that accounted for the bulk of this 442,000. But along with those properties on Howard Lane, uh, we had uh, the other typical kind of projects. We had a slate roof replacement in College Park, uh, some porch work in Hyattsville, and you can see the cross house here in Berwyn Heights had some roof and, and other work. So we had all of the typical kind of work that we see in a normal year for preservation tax credits, but also the surge of activity uh, for these new, new, these new houses on Howard Lane. So we're always happy um, to give away money because it makes us more popular. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to, um, to Dr. Jennifer Stabler, who's going to talk about some of the work that's been done on archaeology in the county. Um, Jennifer, take it away and just let me know when you'd like to advance. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to Alan Verda. He's helped me out a lot this year with um, historic research. When I get stuck, he's always the guy I go to because he knows just about everything out about the county. Um, anyway, Tom has already given you some background on the first site I'm going to talk about. While 
a lot of things shut down in the county, uh, the developers certainly did not. So um, I've been spending a lot of time chasing bulldozers and um, things like that prior to development to try to preserve some of the archeological sites that have been found in the surveys that have been done on some of these development properties. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Topin Castle. And of course that's in Greenbelt. It's in the, um, what's that? The Golden Triangle, Capital Golden Triangle, something like that, um, in, in, right across from Greenbelt Park. But Topin Castle, um, as Tom said, was the, the home of the Walker family who owned this property for almost 200 years. Um, most of this, the area around the house had been previously graded at the time the phase one survey was done back in 2005. So basically all that the archeologists found through the phase one survey were the foundations of the building and they clearly delineated those. Those are, those are um, were very clear. Um, and then there was a, a little bit of an artifact scattered to the north um, right before you got to the areas that were graded. So um, that development didn't go through. And this past year, we received a development for a, ro a Royal Farms to be put in on this property. And of course, we already knew the site was there. The, de the developer knew the site was there. So we worked very closely with the developer to try to avoid um, destroying the, the foundation. And um, we worked together to try to design the site so that it would avoid um, that we could preserve the foundations in place as, as a small park, a little bit of green space in, uh, within the, um, all the asphalt and the buildings that were going to be built on this site. And they agreed to do that. So um, we had some archaeologists go out and um, they did some very limited work. It was mainly just to um, identify the extent of intact or um, um, significant deposits that were associated with the foundations. And they were um, fairly su successful in identifying that area. And we worked with the developer to um, avoid that, that, um, that area where, there's, where the significant um, ruins were, were still present. And um, so in the process, we, we found out that this was a historic resource. And so as Tom talked about earlier, it was designated uh, a Prince George's County historic site earlier um, in, in 2020, and uh, it will be preserved in place. It will be um, like a small park area. Um, there's, there'll be a bench and an, an interpretive sign that people can stop by and read, and there will, there will be sidewalks so people can actually get to the site. And uh, we think it was a, this was a fairly um, good compromise with the developer to preserve the significant portions of this building in place and to bring to light the, um, the significant um, history of this particular site. Okay, Tom, you can go to the next slide. I'm just gonna go through these fairly quickly. Um, the Traditions of Beachfield, this is another development project that's been going on for quite a while and now they've um, finally started um, actually building on the property. Um, back in, I think it was 2007 was when the phase one survey was done. Um, so before, a, a lot of times before a site is being developed, I will go to the deed records to try to determine who owned the property over time and um, how many enslaved people may have lived there and what types of activities were occurring on that site. We're very fortunate in Prince George's County that um, we never had a historic um, um, courthouse fire. So our deed records go all the way back to um, 1696 and um, they're very well preserved. And so in the course of doing the research on this property, I found a, um, this, this property is um, at the Northeast intersection of Route 50 and Route 193. And um, I found a road plat from when Route 50 was put in that showed that there was a cemetery on the north side of Route 50 and on this property. So I'm like, oh great, we know where the, where the, um, where the family cemetery is because doing my deed research, I found that um, when the property was sold out of the, um, the family in 1911, they reserved one acre for a graveyard. So, uh, you know, I thought, oh great, we've, we found the family cemetery. And just to sort of give you a history of this property, um, this property was owned through most of the 18th and 19th century by a Duckett family, Benjamin Duckett. And uh, they were fairly wealthy planners. They were related to Richard Duckett, who lived um, just to the south his, um, his 
Hell site was found in another archaeological survey um, back in 2005. Um, and that was uh, the 18th century. That was the original plantation and that his sons, um, he gave his sons land to the north of his plantation and they built their own um, houses on those. And we know that Benjamin Duckett owned uh, um, or held quite a few enslaved people on this property throughout his ownership. And we actually found some runaway ads that indicated that some of his enslaved people um, were married to um, women who were enslaved on the adjoining um, Fairview plantation, which was owned by Governor Odin Bowie. Uh, so anyway, the, um, the archaeological investigations um, identified some early, or I guess mid 18th to early 19th century material, sort of in the area where you see that red circle there on the drawing. And um, so we went through the process and um, we asked the developer, because they were, um, they were planning a very dense development here, we agreed to let them um, do what, what we call a phase three, which is data recovery, because they could not preserve the sites in place. And in the process of doing those investigations, um, they had done they had excavated um, fairly large areas of these sites, and then uh, we decided to have them strip some of the topsoil off um, just to see if there are other features that we might have missed. And so, in the process of stripping the soil off, um, I got a call one day and I got a picture, and the archaeologist said, "What do you think this is?" And I looked at it, and immediately. I was able to determine that it was a it was a burial. So they had found another cemetery on the site. So I thought, oh great, this is probably the slave cemetery. So the the, um, the archaeologists continued to to um, pull back the dirt, and they were able to delineate the boundaries of this um, burial ground. And uh, I think we eventually determined that that was actually the family cemetery um, because it was very well organized. It had it was fenced and it had a, um, a gate to the, to the east. And we did find um, in one of the um, wills, I found um, one of the daughters of Benjamin Duckett had asked that she be buried at the foot of her mother. And we found a configuration that looked like probably, you know, husband and wife, and then there was a burial at the foot of one of, the, one of those burials. So we believe that that is the family cemetery and that the, the um, cemetery that's near the road it was the uh, cemetery for the enslaved people, which was not mentioned in any of the deeds, by the way, but we knew that there had to be, they had to be there somewhere because they, this family owned quite a few enslaved people. So we, again, we um, worked with the developer instead of moving the cemetery, and it, you know, it's, it's less of a headache for them. We worked with them to preserve the cemetery in place, and then um, arrange their development around it. And that's what you see in this drawing here. They have, they're, they are going to preserve the cemetery in place. They'll put up um, a fence around the cemetery and they'll put some interpretive signage there so that people can learn about the history of this property. So again, we think that's a win-win. We were able to um, preserve some very important features on this, uh, this site through our archeological review process. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is a site that's up in Bowie. It's, um, it's off of Mill Branch Road, right at sort of at the intersection of Route 301 and Mill Branch Road. Um, this site, again, um, this was a development site that came in and the developer um, wanted to do sort of like a, a, a mixed use development. Originally, I think it was supposed to be stores and um, maybe some townhouses and now it's mostly townhouses. Um, anyway, in the phase one survey, um, this whole area was plowed fields. And I always hear people say, oh, you're not gonna find anything in a plowed field. That's, you know, whatever was there, they've plowed it up and no nothing's there. Well, we find plenty of sites in plowed fields. And this was um, one very significant site that we found in the, the plowed field that was part of this development. So um, in the, 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 very, the, the very first phase one survey, the archeologists identified a fairly early 18th century site dating to about, we think about the 1730s, 1740s. And um, so again, the phase one, they, you know, they just identified an artifact scatter, um, no features or anything. Uh, they opened up the site a little bit more and they, they found um, a brick foundation. So we figured out that that was probably a house site. And, and according to the, you know, the artifacts that were found with it, 
it was probably first established in about the 1740s, 1750s. And again, um, going back through the deed records, we were able to identify the families who were associated with this site. They were um, Addingtons, Boyds, um, uh, fairly common names in this area and, and names that we found associated with the town of Queen Anne as well. So these people um, had, so a lot of these people had um, shops or things like that in the town of Queen Anne. They probably sold their, their tobacco out of the port that was once at Queen Anne. And then they had their plantation houses a little bit further to the north where they grew that tobacco and they had um, more expansive holdings to the north of the town. So this was, um, uh, we believe that this site was built by a member of the Boyd family and it was um, the Boyds married into the Go, Go family, G-O-E. And um, we believe that their families inhabited this site for probably about 50 to 75 years. It, it wasn't occupied for a very long time, which is sort of good for archeologists because we can kind of tie a lot of the artifacts that we find to a particular family and really start to tell the story about these, um, these individuals and their families. So um, I meant to put the slide in here that sort of delineated where the buildings were, but where you see the red blotch in the, at the top there, that is what we believe is the house site. And there was evidence of um, a fire fireplace and some burned soil around it. So we were pretty sure that that was the fireplace. Um, some of the other pits that you see are, some of those were trash pits, which are, which are golden for archeologists because they contain a lot of artifacts that can tell us a lot about the activities that are going on on this particular site. And then further to the south, towards the bottom of the screen there, um, is what we think was a, a very large barn, probably for curing the tobacco. Um, so again, this site um, was identified through, through our development review process, and um, it's going to give us some very good information on uh, sort of a mid to sort of, let's see, probably 1730s to 1760s occupation of this property. Um, this site will not be preserved in place. We only go to phase, th when we go to phase three, it's basically you're trying to excavate as much of the site as you can to get the information out of it. We can never excavate the entire site because it's too costly. So we try to, you know, excavate the portions that will give us the, the most information. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this is the Washington Post property. It's located in Forestville. It's, it's um, to the north of Andrews Air Force Base. And this, um, this site was found in, I think it was around 2009 when there was, um, there was a big box store proposed on this particular property. Um, so the archeologists found, uh, there, actually there was, there was a house that had been identified on this, this property, um, I think in about the, 18, the 1970s or 80s, there was a Maryland inventory, inventories of historic properties form. Um, the Ryan family had built a house on this property in the, eight, the 1850s, 1860s, and um, the house was still standing, I, I believe, until the um, about 2000 or so when it was torn down. So the archaeologists, um, again, they did their shovel test pit survey and they identified an artifact scatter away from kind of uh, to the southeast of the main house, the, the you know, the house that the, the newer house with the foundation um, still intact. And the artifacts they were finding here were a little bit earlier. So they, um, we did a phase two on the property and that's when they opened the site up a little bit more. And they found um, this feature, which is a cellar feature. And they dug like a little window down into it and found that um, it went down pretty far and there were several phases um, within that, that cellar and it was, um, it had a lot of artifacts in it. So we asked the developer to do a phase three, which is, you know, you open up the site more, you excavate more of the site, gain more information from it. And we deter they determined that um, this was probably the location of the original house on the property. And this was a cellar that was associated with that house. Um, a lot of the artifacts coming out of it were um, dated to the early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century. And um, the house eventually went out of use. We believe it was an earth fast house. So it was probably wood. It was probably um, set on wooden piers over this cellar. 
And um, it, it indicated that the this was not a wealthy family. It, it was sort of a middling family. You know, they were they were not like middle class family. And um, so when this when the house was uh, destroyed sometime, it, it, this house was not didn't seem to be occupied for a very long time, maybe 30, 40 years before the other house was built uh, a little bit to the northeast northeast of this site. And then after um, that the new house was built, they used this, they used the cellar, the, the owners of the new house used the cellar as sort of like a trash pit. So again, that's a gold mine for archeologists. And so um, we were able to determine a lot about the um, food ways and the life ways of the people who were inhabiting this house from all the trash they left behind. Um, there was also a Native American site found um, not too far from this site on the, on, um, the property, which also gave us a pretty good idea of what the Native Americans were doing on this property in probably about a thousand years ago. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, which I believe is the last one. Um, so Kildare, this is one of our uh, historic sites in the Oxon Hill area. Um, this this site is owned by, well, was owned by Milt Peterson, of uh, the Peterson Companies. And um, so uh, the house is in fairly rough condition. And um, so the developer asked to demolish the house. So prior to the demolition of the house, uh, we asked, um, we asked the owner to do some archaeological investigations to determine, you know, um, we, we didn't want them to destroy the archaeology in the process of bringing the house down. So what you see on the bottom, the archaeologists went out and they found um, uh, near the entry road, the current entry road into the house, they found this very large pit and it was just chock full of material and uh, it contained a lot of um, very early, uh, very early 18th century material. We know from historical records that there were several merchants who owned this property um, in the early 18th century, and they were very wealthy. And the material coming out of here was indicative of that. It was, there were some very um, expensive um, items uh, that looked like, you know, that, that they had, that had been thrown into this pit. Now we're not sure if if this pit is related to we think it may be related to the destruction of the first house that was on this property, which part of what you can see in the upper photo there. Um, the archaeologists also uncovered this foundation um, actually just to the it showed up to the west of the current western edge of the current house that is there. And it looks like the foundation may even go under the current house. So we think that the the current house was built on pretty much built on the site of the earliest house on the prop the 18th century house on the property so um we think that maybe the 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 18th century house was demolished and most of what was in that 18th century house might have been dumped into that pit that you see at the bottom but we're not sure of that yet a little bit more needs to be done to determine that but um um what will happen now is when the, when the house is going to be demolished, we, we're going to ask the developer to try to do it as delicately as possible because we think that the earlier house, remains of this earlier house may go under the, the, the current house. And uh, we wanna try to uh, get more information on this earlier house after the current house is demolished. So um, that will probably happen this year, possibly. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but um, we think it may happen soon. And we're just looking forward to gaining more information on the um, the archaeology that um, this very early site that that came to light um, in the archaeological investigations. Uh, so I think that's it for my archaeology slides. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer. <clears throat> that was. Uh, that was great. As Jennifer said, she will has been and will remain busy chasing bulldozers around the county and ensuring that the uh, the history that we cannot see um, is given its due as well. Um, in addition to the buildings that we preserve or or work with property owners to preserve. Uh, so I'm just coming back to this uh, slide that I started out with, and then we're going to wrap up. So again, these are the numbers where they stand now in terms of our historic sites, our resources, historic districts, and National Register listings and landmarks. And um, I posed the question a year ago, 
where will we be next year? Well, in the past year, we've added four historic sites. We reduced our number of historic resources for evaluation, and we have another historic district. Uh, certainly over the next year, uh, these numbers will change uh, a little bit. Um, I mentioned that we have a historic evaluation pending uh, for one of our grant recipients this cycle, so that will be a potential new historic site, depending on how that evaluation goes forward. Um, if you are interested in viewing um, Historic Preservation Commission proceedings, you might want to tune in on June 15th. I'll just give the, the sneakiest of sneak peeks. We have an evaluation that may be of, of interest to some folks. Uh, Dennis Pogue, I'm looking in your direction. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to um, just flash up here real quick. Our uh, Jennifer and Jennifer's and my um, contact information uh, in case you want to make a note of that, a lot of you already know how to get a hold of us, but in case you don't, here are our email addresses. And with that, I will turn it back over to Howard for closing remarks. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom and Jennifer. Those were really great presentations. There's a lot of content there. It's a lot to take in. Uh, but I think now what we ought to do is take a few minutes and allow people to direct questions to whichever of the speakers uh, the question is relevant. And I've been sort of monitoring the chat uh, as this thing has gone on, and it's mostly chat. There are relatively few pointed questions. So I can either call out the two things that I've noticed, or um, if whoever put those comments in, particularly about 2D scanning and uh, access to the public, and uh, the other question had to do with the uh, potential for um, returning grant funds, essentially creating more of a revolving fund. If you were, were responsible for either of those questions or anything else that you wanna ask about, uh, now's your chance to raise your hand and be called on. Any takers? Or just say hi. <laughs> <laughs> or bye, whichever. <laughs> um, we did run a little bit long. We were sort of billing this until 8.30, but. Uh, oh yes, George asked how to raise hand. I think the best way to raise your hand is to unmute yourself and say, I have a question. <laughs> yes, probably so. <laughs> Yes, hi. I just um, thank you everyone for a fantastic evening of uh, just recapping what the year of your work looks like, particularly for those of us who are not closely exposed to that work of the county. Um, just curious, uh, especially with the cost of construction going up, sort of the uh, tax base isn't necessarily going up in the county. And given how many properties there still are underfunded on this revolving fund idea, uh, who in the county would be the right person to advocate for that to to move forward was that to be able to provide some low interest or no interest resources that sort of subsidized by the grant money but in a way that mul uses a multiplying factor to unlock more resources to people who need them today to preserve their property that will appreciate tomorrow when they sell it uh, that's i guess the kind of a yeah. core question it's a very complicated question and one that was uh, wrestled with when the grant program was initiated about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, grant uh, or revolving funds are extremely complicated to manage. And uh, based on all of the complexities associated with operating a revolving fund, uh, it was determined that that was not the best way to go to leverage public funds. Part of our program is contingent on the awardees uh, granting a perpetual easement to protect the work that these public funds go to pay for. So the, the, uh, the notion that once protected, uh, the, the money that en en enhanced the property didn't need to be returned was one that was much more manageable to undertake. Um, revolving funds typically involve significant financial apparatus, 
not that the Park and Planning Commission isn't a significant financial apparatus of its own, but it was not considered to be a kind of a core mission. So I hope that's a little bit of an answer, but what I would make as, uh, as a suggestion to you is um, the best way to get more money out there in the community is to lobby for an increase in the grant fund. And what I'll, uh, I'll just close out this little discussion by saying the first two years of the grant fund, which I guess were 10 and 11 years ago or 11 and 12 years ago, I can't quite remember at this point, were funded at $500,000 a piece. And then with the vagaries of the economy, uh, the fund was uh, reduced for a number of years to $300,000 a year. And for the last two budgeted years, and we believe the year that is ahead of us, we've kind of inched up to $350,000 a year. So in the back of all our minds is, well, gee, wouldn't it be great to be back at $500,000 a year? Because obviously they were com that was competitive too. There's always gonna be competition, but it was more money to give away. So I would encourage you to advocate for increases to the grant funds when the park and planning budget hearings come around every year. Um, the, more the, park, the more the planning department and the park and planning commission hear from the public, the more likely there will be uh, that a response uh, is made. So, do, so does, that, does that make sense to you, George? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, it, it does. It definitely does, especially the historic context from 12 years ago. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, very helpful. The other question I guess I had in the chat, I don't know if it came clear, is um, there's all these uh, wonderful properties available um, that are sort of public access ones. And is there a way to, I think Jennifer touched upon something that's sort of very emblematic of our county to uh, choose to do a short-term development where the developer builds townhomes and cashes out and moves on rather than sort of tries to do a mixed-use development. And I'm wondering if your program can act as a catalyst for some of the... Um, <laughs> the okay, I think the question is understood based yeah, on your response. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sure. I mean, a lot of us, although we're primarily preser preservation professionals, you know, we fancy ourselves to be planners as well. And, uh, you know, we believe that mixed use communities are probably the most successful ones to, to conceive of. Uh, unfortunately, the market forces that are at play in Prince George's County uh, ebb and flow a little bit over time. Uh, and there has been a substantial in interest historically in townhouses. And um, there isn't much that uh, this little preservation program that we run that, you know, deals with, I don't know, maybe a thousand buildings altogether of the tens of thousands of buildings that are in the county can do to kind of, you know, ships move very slowly and to change direction takes a long time. So obviously we would love to be able to integrate historic resources in uh, thriving multifaceted communities, but that those situations don't always present themselves to us. Um, you know, there are certainly areas of the county like AFA and uh, the Route 1 corridor, which are much more mixed in their character with commercial and industrial and cultural and, and residential uses, but um, that's only a portion of the county. A lot of the county is given over to uh, subdivisions and without without a town center attached to them necessarily. So, you know, we have to deal with the historic resources where they are. Be nice to be able to move them around, but you know, we're not in that business either. So it's it's kind of a it's a very good question, but a complicated one. Um, so this is Megan from Anacostia Trails. Uh, I think it's a good uh, jumping off point too to mention that uh, Preservation Maryland is working on a revolving fund, which is when I was previously there was no small feat. And those will be focused primarily on properties. They may be returned to private ownership or or housing, 
but it is very difficult to to select those projects and especially to get started. Um, a lot of the grants, um, I thought Tom's presentation was great. There are perhaps more tax credits and incentives for property owners than there are grants for property owners. And so that is uh, something to consider. But uh, uh, so the, the grants that Anacostia Trails Heritage Area can, um, uh, as a grant making organization, do have to go to either a, a nonprofit or a municipality. Um, and I think that is a good distinction for us preservationists to think about, um, does everything need to be owned and operated by a, by a nonprofit and, uh, or a municipal entity? And I've really been encouraged by some of the, uh, I just saw something that went out for uh, Bowie for a um, residential curatorship. And I love that uh, program that, the, that uh, Maryland DNR runs as well. So um, I just think that's a, a really good uh, option, uh, something for us to, something for us to consider. Just to, just to piggyback on what Megan said, uh, grant programs are pretty rare beasts to begin with. Uh, we believe our program is unique in the truest sense of that word in this country because uh, we haven't found another program that gives grants directly to private property owners. As Megan said, most of the grants go to institutions or uh, 501c3 corporations that you know operate a historic site or or what have you but um, most of what we do and the money that we give away goes to you know Harry and Harriet homeowner uh, which we believe is a is a unique circumstance in this country as of this moment so we're we're, we're kind of proud of that uh, that isn't to say that it isn't without its challenges but all grant programs and all revolving funds have their challenges. So, you know, we're just happy and glad to be able to give money away and we just wish we had more to give away. Okay, is there anybody else that had a question that uh, they'd like to have answered? Or shall we just uh, call it a wrap? Yeah, I guess I'll speak up at the end here. Uh, I think there's a great need for, I'm Bob Schnabel, by the way, a great need for uh, technical assistance. Uh, I think often uh, people are not uh, aware enough of the, the right thing to do with regard to their, their properties. The historic preservation uh, in the field has become extremely technical and uh, most people are, are really quite unaware of these technicalities that make for uh, long lasting uh, investments. And so uh, I think every homeowner is always seeking uh, good advice uh, with regard to uh, a particular project. And I see this as a tremendous need uh, that, you know, I would hope that uh, more of this would be available through the county assistance uh, in that regard. I think some of that was was touched on. I can't remember which properties were mentioned as as kind of like a learning lab. I do know that there's a there's a couple sites where you know the community not not in Prince George's County. Um, where you can you know sign up and, and kind of get some hands-on experience and also you know work on a building um i i would love to do some sort of um you know maybe in partnership with um some of our um uh building reuse organizations that we have in prince george's county do some um uh, restoration training or or awareness so you even know how to translate what you're asking for um uh, along those lines um, but please uh, always you know feel free to reach out to, to me or um, uh, Preservation Maryland or Maryland Historical Trust also have lists of contractors and uh, I know for instance Preservation Maryland has um, uh, individual if not more on staff who are really there to answer those questions um, I'm, I'm you know I'm and that's on the nonprofit side I'm just new to all the the sources um, on the municipal side here in in the county but there are so it is definitely though the onus is on the property owner to make all those calls and hopefully have the time to do it and that is um something that preservationists are well aware that it's it's not easy it's not easy at all so um 
so kudos for being here and, and sticking with the, the project. So um, it's not easy. And a, and a plug, yeah. since Megan mentioned that sort of thing, we also in Prince George's County maintain our list of preservation professionals, which we, I, if I, I'm sharing my screen, I couldn't possibly try to put something in the in the chat from a website while I'm doing that. But if you go to our website, you can find our list and, and we steer property owners there every day and and it's sometimes a challenge because people will say i've got this project i know just the person that can do it and it's someone who you know clearly you know has never done this sort of work before and we say well you know here's this list of folks that we know do this kind of work and um you know we can't it's we we can we can leave them to that list uh and and do our do our best uh, to, to try and steer them to that yeah, I, I, I guess I'm referring more not to being led to a particular contractor who you would hire to do the work, but some preliminary uh, information with regard to a particular project. Uh, uh, because once you, you know, you've hired somebody, uh, then, you know, you're paying them and you are very much engaged in your project. But I think uh, knowledge of the uh, what's involved in a particular project is important to know before you engage a contractor. And uh, uh, I just find that uh, most people don't know anything. <laughs> I've been working at this for quite a few years now myself uh, as a homeowner and a preservationist and one who has been very much engaged in the preservation crafts. Uh, and I compare myself to other people who own historic properties and their, uh, their, their background is, is just nowhere near where they need to be in order to go about hiring somebody or what's involved in the project. The choice of materials, what's involved there. I mean, it's just extremely complex and it's extremely expensive. And once you start going down a particular route, uh, a lot of the work is uh, it's established for many, many years. I mean, once you start uh, getting into a building and doing uh, uh, repair work, what you have established is something that's set in stone for you know 50 years and it can be the wrong thing that's been done i will say sometimes we it, it's it's true we'll have property owner historic site owners um i know because we get we field calls sometimes from prospective historic property owners and um you know they they see a house that looks attractive and maybe it needs some work done and we're very grateful when they come to us first and ask for some guidance or, or sometimes they will ask do you know of someone that can help me get a handle on what this house needs because i really don't know it's you know where we run into more problems is the people that that buy it without the knowledge and without the the enthusiasm to <laughs> to learn and just kind of plow ahead uh, regardless so it's it's um it's the constant challenge to kind of close the gap between their enthusiasm and their knowledge or their humility in, in, in learning uh, what, what they need to do as a historic site owner. But we certainly uh, we certainly do the best we can. Hey, um, I think that was a good conversation and as good a place as any to, to wrap up. So just one more chance, if there's anybody else out there who has anything they'd like to leave the group with, uh, here's your opportunity and failing that uh, we will wish you happy historic preservation month 2021 and hope to see you in person uh, before the next one rolls around in 2022 you can as as tom said you can always reach out to us um, during the business day at our offices with any uh, lingering questions that you might have we'd be happy to follow up with you so and Howard, I'd like to say something that my um, uh, uh, wonderful preservationist, Joe McGill, who runs uh, the Slave Dwelling Project, who is actually coming to Prince George's County uh, this year. Uh, he's a wonderful historian. He says every month is Black History Month. And I'll say every month is Preservation Month. And I don't think he'd mind me saying that. So uh, um, um, yes, we will 
meet again uh, in a year, but until then the, the work continues. And I just so appreciate being a part of this, this great group. And I learned a lot. So thank you everybody who great. presented. Great, yes. Thanks to all the presenters and those who attended, uh, those who hung in to the bitter end. Um, have a wonderful evening and we'll see you soon. Thank Good night, you very everybody. Much. Thanks so much, Megan. Bye-bye.